Okay, we'll get started. Okay, I got the sign. Well, thank you for finding this room because I was running around the hallway looking for the room. The name was not on the wall on the sign, so this is serverless. If you're looking for big data, sign something. That's not this room. Uh, so my name is Sean Smith. Uh, I'm uh, working on the uh, open source FN project and on uh, Oracle Functions as a cloud platform, and I work for Oracle, obviously. And uh, you've seen this before. Don't buy anything based on what I say, okay? So um, this was North America last week. I'm from Toronto in Canada. So I'm near Montreal. The dark purple stuff was really cold. Like we were like minus 30, minus 20 something, plus wind chill, minus 35. It was not good. So I thought, I, you know, I need to escape this like frozen, this is Toronto here. Lake Ontario is frozen with ducks. And I thought, you know, what I need to do is I need to go north to where it's warmer. <laughs> So I was surprised at how, how much further north we are. Um, but it turns out now it's plus seven, and everything's melting in Toronto, and now I've come here for the snow. So I, I can't win. So I'm going to talk about serverless. Um, serverless is a lot of things, so I want to just set some, some terms first. So serverless is a general, fairly vague term, meaning any kind of service, you, any kind of, sort of cloud service you use where you're not required to provision virtual machines and manage infrastructure yourself. Right, so if you're using you know, Amazon S3 storage, you're sticking stuff in the cloud, you're getting it back, you didn't provision anything, you didn't allocate VMs, you don't patch the operating system, serverless, right? And then functions as a service is typically the com compute component of a serverless cloud platform. So I'm gonna throw some code in the cloud, it's gonna run in the cloud for me, it's gonna do whatever, and I don't allocate VMs, I don't allocate stuff, I just chuck some code in the cloud and it runs. So sometimes people say serverless, they mean functions, I might do that, but it's functions is not quite serverless. It's an instance of serverless. So functions are essentially small pieces of code you would deploy. They have an input, they have outputs, they may have side effects like writing to a database or sending a message in a queue. And uh, it's basically a micro microservice, right? So functions are just, if you're used to building microservices like Spring Boot applications with a REST API with you know, a set of endpoints, functions have one endpoint, right? It's only one. So a typical microservice for banking that might have deposit, withdraw, tran uh, transfer, those would be individual functions. So they're usually very small. And there's all kinds of reasons why you want to do this, why it's good. Um, but let me just move on to where we are. Okay, so, so that's the basically functions. So serverless today is an interesting space. Again, serverless functions, maybe. Interest is high, so people are like, yeah, you know, querying serverless on Google, going, you know, the, the trend is very clear. Um, but Things are maybe a bit out of hand. Um, headlines like serverless is eating the stack and people are freaking out. You know, a a a AWS Lambda has stamped deprecated on containers. Like containers are obviously, they're a fading technology already. Uh, this one's even worse. You know, serverless adoption on par with containers. So who's using containers today? Okay, who's using functions? Okay, they're lying, right? Like this is like hype. Big hype, lots of hype. Um, this is a quote. This is a, a tweet my my colleague Chad Aramur put up. He's talking to some analysts, and they told him, you know, interest in functions from our customers has ranged from out astronomical to outrageous. So people are like hyped. So they're reading the press, and then they're calling up the analysts and they're calling up vendors like Oracle, saying, "What's your function story? It's like the hottest thing like ever." And then if you look at sort of uh, industry or sort of community polling. So Jack Center asked, what's hot for 2019? Service is like number two right after container, so clearly it's on par, apparently. Um, it's hot. But really we're here, right? This is the hype curve. We're at the peak of the hype curve. So right now, like, functions are so cool and service is great. And then soon we'll go down to the bottom, the trough of disillusionment, and we'll think this sucks. Uh, we were sold a bill of goods. They didn't solve all the world's problems. I hate those things. And then as with everything else, every technology, we'll go, oh, it's good for this thing. And we'll use it as part of our toolkit, and it'll be something else we use, right? So don't believe everything you read. Uh, as you can see, everyone in the room is not using functions yet. So it's a, it's a, a new technology, or at least it's a, a technology which is still relatively young. So the question I want to talk about today is what's the story about Java and serverless? Okay, so do, is Java, you know, do you use Java to write functions? Should you use Java to write functions? So Java today, uh, this is GitHub 
um, interest by committers, right, or, or popularity by committers. So commits, Java's number two, right, it's right up there, so that's good, so very popular language. Uh, many of you will know the Red Monk sort of uh, graph here of uh, language rankings, and Java is way up there at the top, so it's hot, right? Java's like, we're, we're at Java conference, so we're doing the right thing. Uh, but it's not that good in the functions world. So these aren't very scientific stats. These are sort of community surveys and user group surveys, or even in this case, New Relic, I think, are keeping tabs on their users. 9.7% um, of functions are in Java. Look at that massive Python, like, like almost half, right? Followed by, by Node has another good chunk. And then, I can't see that one, and Node again. So Node's got a good chunk, Python, Java, small. Uh, Serverless.com, this is actually an article on Go. So they actually an article on Go adoption for functions. They had 6.4% of functions in Go. Java was at 6.1, so it's also not good. So that was not not uh, encouraging. And they had another number, they looked at large companies, so companies with more than 1,000 employees, a bit better. I think larger enterprises are more inclined to use Java, so they had like a number on 14.8%. So um, Java's um, not exactly taking over the world here. Let me just move on here. So the other thing is the trend isn't good. So if you look at the graph here, and the line is, which one is Java? The yellow line's pretty flat, right? It's not like Java's taken off. It's kind of flat. So why aren't you guys using Java right, for functions? Like, what's going on? And really, the, the, it's been out for a while. So Amazon has had support for Java functions since, what, 2015. It's quite a while. Azure only has it in preview, Java 8, and Google doesn't have it at all. So it's not like the world is, you know, all the major cloud vendors are running to Java. In, in Google's case, it's not even, not even there yet, right? So it's, it's, it's not a good story. But the question I really have is, you know, James Monk's famous, uh, uh, Governor, sorry, uh, famous article of, you know, when web companies grow up, do they turn, they turn into Java shops, right? So a lot of companies, Twitter and different people worked on other sort of productive languages and then ended up for enterprise purposes moving to Java. Right, performance, reliability, uh, all that kind of stuff. So the question is, when, when um, we all grow up and start using functions, will we, will, we, will we move to Java? Will Java become a dominant language for functions? Or is it really just a bad fit? And that's the key question I'm, I want to ask. So why are, hasn't Java taken over? Right? Why aren't people using Java functions? Not so much. Um, and the question is, you know, are, is it because people think that Functions are kind of a cloud scripting language. Like you write a little piece of code and you pop, pop it up there and it does something like respond to a small event and it runs for 10 lines and it quits. It doesn't sound like a very Java um, use case. Or is it that it really doesn't, it's a weird experience for Java developers to go to the cloud. Maybe the cloud experience for developing for the cloud is not, does not fit the way we work with our tools. And then functions typically are short lived. So they run for very short periods of time. So it might be it receives a request, your, your code runs, returns a reply, and then in theory, and this platform is optimized, but in theory your code is taken down, like it's quit, it quits, it doesn't run anymore. So the JVM, as we know, has been tuned for many years to run long running workloads like uh, Java E app servers, right? They run for a long time, the hotspot VM, a hotspot incremental compiler will increasingly optimize the code that's run, but if your code runs for like a few milliseconds, then you know, where's the time for, the, for that optimization to happen, right? So uh, maybe the J Java's not, support, not suitable. So I think there's a, there's a recipe here that we need to, or a set of features that we need for Java for the cloud, for, for functions. So the first is I think it should be plain old Java. People shouldn't have to learn something new if you're a Java developer to do functions. Just, just be Java, right? Nothing, just wanna use my Java code and I wanna use my tools. Plain old, the same tools I, I've always used, why should I have to learn new ones? Seems unfair. And I want to be able to build complicated applications. People are so far in the function space, and there's an evolution going on, but we're building small sort of event-driven functions. But there's a move now to build larger complex applications uh, out, of app out of functions combined together. And I'll, and I'll take a look at some, some solutions around that. And of course, I want it to be fast. This is, you know, has to be fast. And I want to take advantage of the Java ecosystem. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on in the Java ecosystem, and I want to make sure that if I'm doing functional work, that I can uptake those advancements in, in what I'm doing every day. So 
this is sort of the the set of things that I want I want I want to have in a in a Java uh, function developer's experience. Um, I'm going to talk in terms of the context of the FN project. So I work on FN. Um, you can find it here, fnproject.io. It's uh, it's open source, Apache two. Uh, we're built on containers, and it's basically a, an F, it's a functions as a service platform. Uh, it runs anywhere. I'm going to run it on my laptop. It runs in the cloud. At Oracle, we're building a cloud service out of this, like we're you know making it a full managed service, uh, and it's got really good Java support. So I work for Oracle. We like Java. Uh, I got a lot of people who know Java, so we're, we have really good support for Java in the platform. Although it does support Go, Ruby, Python. Uh, node also, and pretty much any language you want, but those are the, the, the core ones. And in this model, this container native model, we're packaging functions as container images. So in all, you'll see that in the demos I show you, we take the function code, we package it as a container, and that container uh, is deployed to the cloud and is run, that containers are spun up when functions are called and taken down again. And that's going to have a big impact in terms of what, I, what I'm trying to do. But functions are are Docker container images, and what that means is you get to leverage all the things you know about Docker. And you'll see me type a few Docker commands here and there in demos because it's basically a Docker experience. And what's good about that is there's no magic, right? So a functions platform is just orchestrating a bunch of work, is doing work for you, it's, it's scheduling jobs, um, but it's still just stuff that you can understand. So what's nice about the Docker, uh, taking on Docker is, since most of us are using Docker, um, what we're doing is, is comprehensible, right? It's not some magic platform. Um, this, this number is really interesting. This came from the new stack in terms of where is serverless fallen short. I, I pulled this out because the number one thing they complain about, people have complained about, the respondents anyway, is portability. The problem is today, if you go to Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft, etc., uh, it's all proprietary. Right? So everyone has built their own functions platform, their own APIs, etc. So we're building this in open source with the, the view that uh, and there's other open source projects too, right? So uh, there's OpenWhisk. So we believe that that's, that's the way to go, right? So there's a CNCF, the Com Container or Cloud Native Compute Foundation, which sponsors a lot of uh, cloud tools that you're probably familiar with. And they have a serverless working group, which we're involved in. So there's a lot of work going on in the open, but uh, I think that we're going in the right direction using open source. So if you're interested, of course, you can download this and try it out yourself later. But uh, I think open source is the, the way to go to address the principal concern people have, right? How do I get my code from cloud A to cloud B if I don't like, like cloud A? All right, well, let's take a look at this FN and Java uh, support. So what we've got is, I've got a function developer kit, an FDK. We have these for different languages. And in our case, the FDK has some Docker build images that contain Java C, all the tools you need to compile, has Maven to compile your code. And then we have images designed to take your compiled code and just run it. Right, so it just contains enough of, the, um, of Java to run your code. We don't need all the tools at runtime available, right, so we make it smaller. We have JUnit support, so if you're developing functions, um, you want to just write some unit tests, right? You don't want to have to deploy the cloud to do a test. You want to run it in your local machine, just do a fast, you know, make a change, hit the button, get green, feel good, go on to the next step. That should be possible, and we have that in the Java FDK. And today it's supported, uh, we support Maven for builds, um, not because we don't like great, great Gradle just because we built Maven first and we haven't got to Gradle uh, yet. And there's some nice input output coercion. I shall show you that later and I'll show you flow too. So why don't I just, uh, just go to code. Code's more interesting. Let me show you what it looks like here. Okay, can I just switch? I can, okay. So there's this FN uh, command line uh, tool you can install. It has all the, basically it's very command line centric. Um, for you to build, deploy, manage all your applications. So I'm going to do, a, first I'm going to start the FN server. So FN start, you do, okay, thank you, because I didn't look. <laughs> I did say, will that work? You should have said no. No, it did not work. Okay, I'll do it again then. Okay, so I'm saying this is FN CLI. So I'm going to say FN start. This is the local developer experience. I'm gonna say D for, for daemon background. So I start a FN server. So that's just a bit of Go code. It's running as a bunch of Docker, uh, Docker containers, or actually it's running as a Docker container, and inside of it, it's got a few pieces, like it's got an embedded database, and a queuing system, and some storage, just for a nice developer experience. So if I do a Docker PS, actually if I go over to uh, Portola here, which is a little, little console for looking at my system. Oops, I'm gonna look at containers and do a refresh here. 
Okay, so I've got the FN server running here. A few other things are running too, actually. All right, so what I can do is I can say, if I go to the top, oh, this is a pain, right? To get to the top of the screen so you can see better at the back. So if I say FN uh, init, I can't type, standing up. Uh, runtime uh, Java 8, say, and I'll call my function hello J. Okay, so we have some built-in boilerplate generation. This is nothing special. Uh, we put functions in folders of the same name by default, and you can see there's a POM there. Basically, there's nothing very, by intention, there's nothing very exciting about the code. As I said, we're trying to just have plain old Java. So here's a Java function. There's not a lot going on, right? So there's no imports. I got a class, it's got a method uh, that is the function, um, and it takes a string, and it does the old hello world thing and returns you another string. So what's happening is, when you deploy this code, we will take the code, we'll wrap it up in a, in a container, we'll boot, the, we'll boot up, we'll call the, the method on the class that's identified, and we will examine the signature of the function to see what it takes. So in this case, it takes a string, so the incoming payload to the function will just be passed as a string to this function. And I'll show you what I can do. I can actually change that. So, that. so it's nice in Java, unlike other languages, the Java FDK can introspect your code and know what you're asking for and what you're returning, and it'll coerce the types. So there's, there's a little function. It's very simple. There's a test generated also here. It's a bit longer. So I've got a little uh, Jner rule. I can, um, sorry, I can create an instance of the function invocation. I can say which class and which method is being invoked. I can invoke it in this case with no args, and then do an assert on the result. So this is simple, right? So I can hit, you know, I'm in, I'm in code, I hit run, I get green lights, it's all good, right? So I can sit here and I can do, obviously, way more sophisticated things than that. I can pass in complex workloads, I can set up the context for the function, like what's the environment look like, I can do all kinds of config. But the basics are there. So what I can also do, just to show you the uh, coercion, is I'm going to cheat. I've got a, oops. Sometimes you can't type and talk. All right, let me grab this code here. So I've grabbed a little version of this. I made a small change. So if I replace the body of this function, the version that has a little class. So I've created a little pojo here, greeting, it has a string. And I've changed this, this method to return this pojo. So what's gonna happen is the FDK, if I run this code, the FDK can see that the result uh, return of the function is now a pojo, and it'll by default use JSON to marshal it to JSON. Same for inputs. So it's default behavior, you can actually customize this, you can customize the marshaling in terms of JSON annotations on your classes, or you can actually replace the marshaling entirely with XML or your favorite, but by default it's using Jackson. So it's kind of nice to have this like automatic behavior. Now, um, I didn't run the code before, so I didn't run the test, well you saw me run the test before, but now the tests are broken, right? So if I run this test, uh, I lost the package? Thank you. Let me go back over here and grab it. Okay, I should have told you that we're pair programming. You should have told me earlier that I, more? That's good, right? Okay, so if I screw up again, please tell me sooner. Okay, is that good? Okay, so let's try, this, try the test here. It's going to fail. Okay, it fails. Okay, so I'm going to do what you should never do. I'm going to just delete the test. <laughs> Don't try this at home. I'm going to do it because the build's going to fail. So if I come over here and say fn deploy uh, the app, we'll call it jfocus, uh, and I'll say local. Local just means please don't push my Docker image to Docker Hub or somewhere else because I'm just working local, so don't bother. So it runs the build. What happened behind the scenes is we just generated a Docker file, ran that Docker file, built a container image, and then destroyed the Docker file. It turns out that if you're more of a power user, you can actually write your own Docker files and do whatever you like. So you can pack, um, pack uh, operating system packages and all kinds of whatever you need. So what's nice about this container native approach is there's, it's really easy to use. You didn't see Docker per se, but if you are a Docker uh, user and you have to do fancy things, you can, right? So 
That was a key design principle of FN was easy, to, easy for new people, advanced users have power tools. Right? So anyway, it's built, and I can call it. FN uh, invoke uh, the JFocus application. Hello, J. Right, so it runs, right? So not very exciting. Or I can do something like, uh, it really is hard to type standing up. People have standing desks, I don't have one. Like that's what I need, right? So I did the same thing, I can invoke the function again. Oh, that's very wobbly. And pipe some input into it, and I get back, right? So now actually you may have noticed it's slightly sl slower the first time, and I'll come back to that, but it was, it was fast the second time, right? Actually, I'll give, you a show, I'll give you a little look here back at Portola. If I look at the list of running containers, there's a container here, that's my function, and it's in a paused state. So what happens is when FN starts up your function, the container, it keeps it alive, right? Because you're gonna call it again. After a while, if you don't call it, it'll disappear. So 30 seconds or so over the default, it'll disappear. Meanwhile, since it's not being called, it's put into pause state to free up as many resources as possible, so to keep it to minimal footprint. Okay, well, if you sit here long enough, it'll go away, but it lasts about 30 seconds. All right, let's go back into the presentation here. All right, so what we saw there, we saw plain old Java. I don't think anyone would be shocked that Java looked pretty boring. Uh, I saw Maven, code, I could use Eclipse, uh, IntelliJ, whatever, right? So this is not a, a dis this, this experience of using functions so far as I, sh I should think looks pretty comfortable. You know, it looks pretty normal. Now, building complex applications. So um, there is a trend now. There's, a, there's work going on. Azure has Azure durable functions. IBM has some experimental stuff called uh, Composer. Uh, there are step functions from Amazon. Uh, a lot of different attempts at how do I build applications out of functions. So we are working on the same problem. We have come up with something called FN Flow which in spirit is more like Azure's work on durable functions. We believe that if you want to describe an algorithm for how functions fit together, it should be written in a, a programming language. So rather than have you write YAML or XML files that describe some sort of workflow kind of thing between functions, we just write code. So what we did was, we built this thing called FN Flow. Uh, it has primitives for fork, join, um, error handling, and it's built on the Completable Features API. So who's used Completable Features, anyone? Very few, okay, so um, if you know completable features, you'll go, oh yeah, that's so good. But if, since no one actually, hardly anyone uses it, it probably looks really foreign. So it's, completable features was built for handling threads. So it gives you a feature-based or a promise-based API for handling work done by threads. What we've done is, uh, because we could not extend or implement that API, it's actually the completion stage API, um, we had to implement something that looks just like it. So we talked to Brian Getz and they had his input on like, how do we make this thing look good and acceptable? But we've adapted the completion stage API uh, to functions. So rather than having threads, we actually have functions somewhere in the compute fabric that are being run as part of your application. So let me, uh, I'll give you a demo here. So I've got a small example uh, application. So it's a little travel application. So I'm gonna go and ask for some recommendations on where should I go on vacation? Okay, so I've got some other functions who give me help. So I have one that'll give me some destination options. It'll give me back some random choices. I've got a system that will give me quotes for if I want to go to Paris, how much it will cost me to go to Paris. And I have another function that gives me the weather. So really, if you're booking, if you're doing a, a travel agency, those are the things you want to know. Where can I go? How much is it going to cost? What's the weather? Maybe you want to book a car, book a flight. All those things are possible too, right? Those are all separate functions. So then how do I build this application when someone comes to me and says, I want to book travel, how do I do that? Well, I'm composing them together, right? So I have to compose these functions together. So let me just show you what that looks like. And this, is, uh, this work is sort of experimental. So I'm giving you an idea of what, what we can do. We haven't quite completed this. And honestly, FN itself, is in um, development still. We haven't got to 1.0. So we're in the, currently in a transitional phase where unfortunately flow is not as interesting in terms of what you can see as, as it has been in the past. Uh, but we're gonna work on that. So I've got, a little, I've got that pre-built here. You can see it, oh darn it, thank you. It takes so long, all right. All right, so here I've got this thing. Let me just make sure it's uh, running, I think it's running. Yes, it's already ready. Okay, I think it's all, all good to go. So I've got here, if I bring up code here on this. 
Anyone know how to get rid of this like Java welcome overview page? Every time you open up the code, it gives me the welcome to Java. All right, so what I've got here is it's a Java application. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get instances of these functions and I'm gonna invoke them. Okay, so I'm gonna use all the usual Java uh, language constructs I have. If you look down the very bottom, there's a convenience function here which is going, in, going to get the current flow, which is our API, and it's going to actually invoke a function. So we're gonna invoke a function. We've got API to invoke this function and return a, it'll return a future, right? So we have basically the completion stage API. So the algorithm is a bit long here because there's quite a lot in here. I'm not gonna try and go through it exhaustively. But you can see here that I'm going to, for example, invoke the number of destinations functions function, and I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna get the, the contents of that, and I'm gonna store that as, uh, get start with the JSON, and then I'm gonna go off to the next function with my JSON, and I'm going to uh, get uh, the weather, and I'm gonna get quotes for these things. And we've actually intentionally, if I show you the functions, another function here, uh, let's see, let's go look at the, the weather forecast. So the weather forecast function, they intentionally have failures built in, because it's much more interesting to watch things fail. Uh, you can see here, we're, we're actually gonna time us. All this thing does is it just returns randomly some kind of weather, hot, cold, snowy, whatever. But we wait a little while, and then we randomly kind of, kind of fail. So it's good, so we get some, some interesting uh, behavior. So I've got a bunch of functions, they're all written independently, I can test them independently, I can test the weather, test the quoting, and then compose them together with another function. It's again, all a bunch of Java code. And so I can run this code, and uh, what I've got here is I'm gonna open up another tab. Again, this is kind of experimental UI. So we have visualization, so one of the problems when you're dealing with distributed systems, which essentially this is, is understanding what's happening. And so if I go and run this code, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna say, um, give me seven recommendations, uh, invoke, it's called the request application, it's request function, I think it is. Oh. Okay, now you see some more FN API, so what are my functions? Okay, I did not deploy this code, okay, so my mistake. Let me just start, stop a few things, whoops. So I've got some things running here, some services running that I should have rebooted here. So I'm gonna docker stop, the flow UI, the flow server. And I'm gonna do that setup I told you I was gonna run, okay. So I'm just gonna build the whole thing. So I'm building all these functions, deploying all these functions. You see docker commands going by because I've put it on, on verbose mode. Everything's booted up there. Okay, so let me go back over here. Here's my UI, so what I can do is try that command again. So invoke, I'm asking for seven, off, seven recommendations for my vacation, where should I go? All right, so what we get over here in this UI is I can sort of visualize what's happening in terms of the flow. So I've got these parallel functions. You're seeing a number of functions happening in parallel, so they're going side by side. Things are failing or in red. And this is the work that's to do, so I can sort of get an idea of what's going on in my application. So um, this is a very cool UI. Unfortunately, right now, the state we're in, it used to be that you can click on a bubble and get the full stack trace for Java, or click on error, um, error uh, bugs. So we throw in exceptions on, on purpose, but take a look at the stack, see what the exception is. So right now, that's kind of broken as we've been developing. But this is a really nice way to sort of look at your application. In fact, you can look at this code and go, it's actually terrible code, uh, because the top bar is that container function, containing function. And I think I told, so the, that outer function is waiting around for the others to finish. If you're doing this, if you're running functions properly and chain them together, you would not have a function who just sort of runs waiting doing nothing. Because in the functions that service platforms, you're paying for functions. Even if it's sitting there doing nothing, waiting for responses, you're paying for it. So you want to really, really want to write functions that sort of, you know, fork, fork off more work. And then the results typically end up in a bucket or a message sent back or something more asynchronous. This is a synchronous function. It's not very good. But... The point is there's actually a way to build more complicated applications. Um, we have another sample. If you go to the, the uh, fnproject.io and go look at tutorials, there's one called Flow Saga, where we're doing a version of this travel agency. We're booking flights, and then we're having to do compensating transactions when things go wrong. So we have really interesting um, logic. But looking at um, orchestrating functions with the completion stage API, which has full ex exception handling ability, is really amazing. So when things go wrong, you can catch them. Uh, when anything goes wrong in a parallel thread, you can catch all the results and deal with it. So it's really, really interesting uh, control levels you have compared to, say, writing some sort of YAML spec for how to orchestrate work. So we really think that Java, uh, as a language for writing your, your algorithms, makes, makes complete sense.
All right. So that's interesting, but let's, let's dig into some more, some more Java stuff, okay? So there's a few Java things. I want high, low latency, high performance Java functions. That's clearly, clearly an issue. Um, and there's a few things I want and there's a few ways to get it. So first off, I, since I'm running in containers, I need Java to behave well in a container environment. Um, I need it to respect the resources that the container makes available to it. So when I'm running Java in a container, I don't have all the memory of the host. I have the memory that's allocated in the container, for example. Uh, I want it to start fast, I want to run fast. So there's a few things I need to do here. What, 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 what do we have in Java today? So the container story is pretty good. Uh, it's not fully done yet, but Java has in the past not behaved well in containers. So things like how much memory is available, it would get the memory size of the host rather than what's available in containers. So they're making a bunch of work, there's a bunch of work around making Java work in container. I think it's, it's looking good now. Um, the container metrics, I think, in 11. Uh, is a useful feature. Uh, so there's a number of things they're doing, and this is a, obviously a topic of interest, like running Java in container is like the way of the future, right? Everyone's running Java on the cloud in containers, Java better behave. So that's good. So Java, there's a lot of work by the Java team into this context. Uh, there's other things that are interesting, and yet I don't, I, that may be useful for us in the function space, things like Epsilon, the ability to turn off the garbage collector entirely. Uh, and there's some interesting uh, use cases where that, that could, be, could be useful. So in terms of fast startup, I don't know if everyone knows, but you know, when you start your Java application, every time you do that, the JVM parses the JDK classes. So it runs through those bytecode, your jars, and converts them into in-memory structures every time. So why not do that once at the beginning, at compile time, and then at runtime, skip that step, make it faster, right? So there's class data sharing. Uh, who's using class data sharing? Anyone? No one. Okay, it's been there since 2004. I'm going to tell, I keep telling, every audience I talk to goes, no, we don't use that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell the JVM team. Like, they worked on this poor feature. Uh, so you can take all the JDK classes, and it'll basically pre-parse the, the files and dump them as an archive. So you have this binary archive in a faster-to-load format. And you can do the same thing to your applications with application data, data sharing. So you can compile your, or pre-parse your classes, again, into an archive and have them load. It, boots, it improves the, the performance time of the Java VM start. The problem is it does add, it's a space speed trade-off. You're gonna have these archives now. You've got these files that are a bit plumper than you'd like. And I was saying before, I want small. So I can get faster JVM start time, but I'm gonna have a, the expense of that will be a larger Docker image file. Uh, another possible technology you can use is AOT, right? ahead of time compilation. Um, I don't have the link here to the, to the, uh, the JEP, but uh, you can do this now, you can compile your code into a library and link it to the JVM, right? So you can actually do that. Uh, I'm gonna look at the Grawl solution to this, but AOT is another good idea because of course it'll boot faster, right? You compile it down to native machine code now. In terms of smaller images, the reason I want smaller Docker images is because imagine a world where I've got this big cloud compute fabric and I've got a compute node that's completely empty and you, I, and some, for whatever reason we decide we're gonna run a function on that compute node. I've got to go and pull the Docker image from, the, from that Docker registry to that machine and start it up. Transferring files that are larger takes longer than transferring files that are smaller. So smaller will improve my time to transfer and network is an expensive piece of boot time, right, can't be bad. Uh, and then also Docker images, um, booting a Docker image has, has, has costs, like setting up the copy on write uh, caches, um, and every layer you have in a Docker image actually decreases the performance. So if you've got, if you've got a, a Docker image based on a Docker image based on an image going from, 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 you've got this big stack of layers, it's slower to boot than if you have a few layers. So there's all kinds of things that we're doing to optimize the runtime world so that it works. I mean, it's all Docker-centric, but we have to do this. Uh, in terms of size, also you have JLink. Who uses JLink? Oh my God. Those guys, those guys that are slaving away, those people are slaving away on these, on these features, no one's using them. So that'll let you remove code you don't need, right? Gives me, um, I can also get a small Docker-based image, uh, and I can use Substrate VM from Grawl. So let me talk about those, those three things. So first off, uh, this is with 11, this is a small example of what JLink can do for you. So there's, a, there's your, your JVM, with all your JDK classes and your teeny tiny function, right? It's massive JDK classes. If you're running JLink, you're gonna shed a lot of it. Most of the classes you're not using. Right? There's tons of stuff in the JDK that your, your, your code won't use. 
So this is a very simple way to shrink down the size of your, of your application. And if I'm going to package that in a dark container, I'd rather package this than that one, right? for sure, right? Transfer time, all that kind of thing. Next, I want to take that application, I'm going to run it on a small image. And so Alpine is the thing we're all familiar with as the sort of the small, small base image. Uh, about four meg, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Node runs on, on Alpine, lots of stuff runs on Alpine. Java doesn't actually run on Alpine out of the box. Um, because they use the muscle uh, C library, and the JVM is built on lib, uh, the, lib, uh, the, the GCIB, glibc. And so this Project Portola, which is basically a port, so they're viewing uh, Alpine as a, as a port to run the JVM on Alpine and Muscle on that library. Uh, you can actually get Java today working on Alpine, but you have to bring in libraries and all kinds of stuff, which will, again, make it larger. So there's native support for Alpine coming in Portola, which is not done. But that would be nice to have nice small images. And the last thing that I really want to talk about the most is, is about Graal. So who went to the talk earlier from Oleg on Graal? A few? Okay, so he, he uh, showed at the end uh, of, his, of his talk, he showed Substrate VM. And uh, for me, that's the most interesting thing. This is just complete ahead of time compilation of your Java app to a binary. And what's really cool about this is you get like a little, a little binary, it's native machine code. Uh, they're small and they boot really fast. Right? So there's no parsing of bytecodes, there's no loading of those archive files because it's just native machine code. The other thing is it has very low overhead because it eliminates a number of things like, for example, uh, the code cache. If you don't have a hotspot incremental compiler, you don't need the memory to hold the incremental uh, compiled code. It's all gone. I can't remember, there's like two or three of the memory spaces Java uses are eliminated by using substrate VM, just ahead of time compilation. So it's, it's really cool stuff. So let me show you what, what that can do for us in terms of the function space. Okay, let's see here. All right. So, I'm gonna run a little script. I wrote a little script because there's a few commands to type here. So I'm gonna run a, I'm gonna create a new function using, um, we, have a, we have a feature for pluggable boilerplate generation. So it's a nice feature in FN. You can actually write your own boilerplate. The Graal team have written support, so-called init, init image for Graal. They call it the Java, uh, FN Java native init. And it just produces boilerplate. And I've just got a function here. Oops. Hello, SVM. And uh, let me show you what that looks like. So what does a Graal function look like? Well, it turns out exactly the same as it used to look. So there's my little hello world, right? Hello function. The only thing that's changed here really is the addition of, a, of some uh, reflection uh, overrides. So the problem is Graal, when you comp use SVM, sorry, when you're compiling a, uh, your Java code, it looks at your main program and then it, does, it walks the, the call graph and it figures out what classes are in the transitive closure and includes that into the compilation unit it produces. Since we basically reflectively invoke your function, we have to tell Graal, please keep the function, right? So keep the function and everything it calls. And so we have a little declaration here saying, there's the method and the class that we're actually implements the function, so keep it. So that's a good thing to know uh, because it runs basically automatically. Other than that, uh, this is the same. In this case, just to point out to you, I mentioned power users can use Docker. So you'll see here that uh, I didn't say this is a Java function in my function YAML file. By default, it's Docker. And then the subversion guys, or the sorry, the subversion, SVM guys have produced a, a Docker file for building. Now, it looks complicated. It's the same as ever. It just runs Maven up here. Interesting part is it calls the Graal native image compiler. It'll take an application built by Maven and then further compile it one more step. Okay, so let's just run this thing. All right, so if I could say, um, I'll do it uh, verbose mode here, uh, build. Actually, I'll just do deploy. App, uh, JFocus. Now, it's probably gonna go too fast. Here's the Maven build. Okay, it's pulling some stuff. Oh, no, I don't wanna do that, hang on. It's pushing up to Docker Hub, and I said I wouldn't, didn't wanna do that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna touch the code, because the problem is, the problem is that uh, Docker is very clever about layers. So if you've ever recompiled the same code again, it goes, yeah, I got that. So I'm just gonna forcibly change the file so you can watch it actually compile. And let me add on a minus local here. I want you to see because it takes longer. So it runs the Maven build, 
That's normal enough, right? And then you'll see it pause, runs the tests, and you'll see the native code compilation. Here you go, so here's the native image. So this is the guy who's walking through all my code to find out what I need. Now it takes a while longer, right? This is now walking through the code, looking at the, at the class references, working its way through, and then it's gonna do native machine code generation. So it runs, don't worry about the warning. I don't even know what it means, but it always works. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So this is what you pay, right? This is ahead of time compilation. So it's so great with Hotspot. Run, you know, compile, run, compile, run. Now I'm like, well, I really am, I, I wanna do this now so that later it's fast. So, well, you'll see the benefits in a second, and then we'll, we'll figure out how we should use this. Okay, well, it's actually taking longer than usual. Maybe it's because I'm watching. Okay, almost. It's like watching the kettle. Okay, Just don't look. Oh, man. I have never seen it take this long. This is a bad advertisement for, the, uh, <laughs> for, for, for SVM. Oh, okay. Ooh, there we go. Something happened there. I don't know. All right. And now it's basically packaging it into the Docker container. Okay, so what's interesting about this? Let's just take a look at the size. Okay, so if I do a Docker, Docker images, and I'll filter that on hello. I have two hello functions there. Okay. So here's the hello Java one I made earlier, the Java 266 meg. That's, that was not using JLink, but that's your basic hotspot app, 266. The Grawl one is 20 meg. Okay, 20 meg. So now they're both deployed. If I make sure, just in terms of top here, if I say fn list the applications, there's my JFocus app, and uh, fn list the functions of the JFocus app. Two functions, hello Java, hello SPM. So I'll run them. So if I run, if I time this, fn invoke uh, jfocus application, and I'm gonna run the hello Java one. So nothing's running right now, it's, it's pretty cold, right? So it'll take some time. Okay, 1.15 seconds. This is not scientific, this is like my Mac, you know. Uh, and now let's run the other one. 0.614 seconds. So the difference there really is, uh, I haven't had to pull this across the network. It's all just sitting on my machine. This is just boot time. This is Docker boot time, right? I boot this up and it's booted the application. Inside the container, when I called the function, the container started up, then it ran a JVM in the Java case. It loaded the code, invoked the code. It parsed all the, the JDK classes, all that kind of stuff, right? And then it returned me the result. In the SVM case, I just had this binary. It was called, it, it basically booted in like no time return results. So it's really quite, it's quite small. Now once we've got them running, however, there isn't a huge difference. Uh, Java one, they're both running probably on similar, oh that one's a bit slower still. It's pretty varied given this is my a little laptop here. Uh, but really that whole start time was the big, was the big thing. So there's a huge, huge difference. So what I'm thinking is, you know, when you're working interactively and doing development work, hotspot, right? It's fast, it's interactive, it's comfortable. When you're moving to that final production stage, like you're heading towards production, start, I figure the switch would be over to SVM. People start spending the time to compile, run those things in test, uh, because they'll offer really good production performance benefits. But in development, I'm thinking that, you know, no one wants to wait around for that long build, so. All right, let's go back over here. And I don't have too much time. I'm not gonna explain this next feature in, in great detail. Oh, five, five, okay, great. I won't go into this in great detail, but there's another feature in, in Grawl that's really cool um, called Isolates. And there's a blog about this. If you Google Grawl VM and Isolates, uh, you'll find a nice article on this. What they do is um, you're able to run work, uh, run code in isolated uh, heap areas. There's own GC. So you can say run this code and keep it separate from that code, which means there's no static sharing between these two different isolates. It's all separate. So in the functions case, and we have not tried this, this is pure speculation on my part. Um, what I'm thinking is that we can use isolates to run functions. So what really happens inside of, of uh, FN is this Docker container has the FDK and the FDK has got a little loop, right? So we invoke a function, our, our little FDK code there receives the request, invokes the function, returns a response, and then waits for another response, another request. After 30 seconds, it will be killed if it's idle, but it just sits there looping. Well, answering requests. 
The problem is you're in, the, you're in a JVM, right? So you're sitting there, so static state would leak. So if you want to make sure your code is really pure and isolated, we could use isolates in SVM to separate the work to ensure a completely pristine execution environment so there's no pollution across invocations. You've probably all written JUnit tests where you get cross-testing pollution, right? You run test A, B, C, D, and E fails. E looks totally good, right? And E by itself, it works. You run A, B, C, D, and then it fails because you've got leakage. And so this can happen in your production code. So isolates are a way for us to essentially uh, run a function in its own isolated area and then when the isolate is destroyed, everything is gone. What it also means is I can turn off the garbage collector. Because if I run a Java function in this isolate, it runs for a short period of time, why garbage collect? It's going away, right? It runs the code and then I just kill it. I, don't, I mean, all the garbage is gone, the code's gone, everything is gone. So this is a really cool thing. So there's even more stuff going on in the Grawl space that we can leverage in, uh, in functions for sure. So we could give you a bit of a tour there. Um, for, for serverless Java, you know, you saw plain old Java, you saw my normal tools, there's some prospects of writing complicated applications, there's some really cool things going on in terms of performance for Java in the, in the cloud space, in the function space, and there's all these changes, right, so new, new, new features are coming in the JDK, there's Grawl work around the ecosystem, so there's all kinds of cool stuff that can, we can uptake into the function space, so it's kind of my, my my proposal, my, my thesis here, or my, my conclusion is that I really think that, you know, we should be, we, sh we will have the, uh, the case where companies will grow up, right? Uh, you know, web companies grow up to use Java. Uh, functional users will grow up to use Java also. I think Java's got a really good, um, good set of options. I think the problem is in the past, um, there has been no focus on Java, right? The cloud providers have not spent the time on Java, uh, and now we're doing that. So I think that it really is a good, uh, a good, future for use of Java, so all our skills that we have will be useful in the cloud, right? So it's, it's a good news. Um, other than that, all I have to say is there's, uh, my corporate sponsors have asked me to mention that there's a, uh, some labs you can do at the Oracle booth to get a t-shirt, you should do that. Uh, if you like doing some IoT labs, other than that, um, I can take questions on the microphone if someone has any questions. And they, they're recording this, they want you to speak into the mic. Or, or you shout and I will repeat the question. Yes? Uh, when the machine saves up, is this basically a very small part of time compared to com completely coming up? Is the VM still running before it falls? Yes, yeah, so the question is, is if, if it's already running and then you get a second request, uh, how fast is that? So in the case we saw, you saw that container was in a paused state. So it actually was still running. So it was in memory, it was still loaded, it was just basically told don't consume CPU, um, do nothing. So when a request is received, we unpause, and call it again, so it's, 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 it's really fast. The hotspot would basically over time so in that case, if you had hotspot, yes, it would learn. Although for various um, sort of sanitary reasons, we would, we would kill these things off on a regular basis anyway. Like we don't want a container sitting around running forever. Probably best, because they're disposable. So we will cycle them. So it will only learn so much. Right, so the question is running for an hour. So right now, most, most functions platforms, the most I've heard is 15 minutes. People are not thinking this is a bad, I mean, it looks like it's good for batch jobs. And so I'm wondering whether, you know, is that a slightly different use case? But uh, generally people don't run 15 minute or hour jobs today. And there are people who would like to, yeah. Okay, I'm out. Okay, thank you very much.